I'll start. Good morning, you all. I'm Somdat Kakara, CCMB Science Communication Officer, and I welcome you all to CCMB Biolog. CCMB Biolog is a student-led initiative at CCMB where students invite national and international experts in life sciences for a detailed interaction. Started last year as a pandemic took over our lives, through Biolog, we have been able to meet life scientists who look into the tiny biomolecules into the cell, who study cell behavior, those who are developing tools to look into these and play with these molecules as well as cells, to those who are looking at life as a large systems biology, from a large systems biology approach. From the most fundamental questions to in life sciences to developing and harnessing the most cutting edge technologies, Biolog has been a top series that has brought speakers together from across the world. Today is our 11th Biolog and we are joined to um, joined by Professor Michael Rappe, all the way from UC Berkeley. Thank you, Professor Rappe, for being with us today. His talk today will be on ubiquitin, a protein that is ubiquitous in probably in, in every cellular and molecular biologist's life, biologist's life. His lab looks at ubiquitin from multiple angles, biophysics, biochemistry, as well as they develop new cellular techniques to understand this ubiquitous protein. We'll hear more about him and his talk, uh, work from Dr. Shankar Narayanan in a while. Before I give Shankar the mic, a few do's and don'ts for our audience today. The talk will run for uh, roughly 45 minutes. During the talk, you can write your questions in the Q&A box. Please do not write the questions in the chat box. It becomes difficult for us to navigate through them. After the talk, we'll pick questions from the Q&A section and try to address them as many as we can. Alternately, you can also raise hands after the talk. We'll unmute you and let you ask the questions directly. And we are also streaming on YouTube. The same applies for uh, the, um, the, the YouTube audience can put their questions in the chat box there and we'll try to address them. Before we get into all of these, let me now invite Dr. Shankar Narayanan to introduce our speaker, Professor Michael Rappi, to our audience. Shankar, over to you. Can you hear me? Can, can, you, can you hear me, Samdata? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, very good morning to all of you. And uh, welcome to this 11th edition of CCMB Biolog, as Somdata was uh, mentioning. Uh, first of all, I must commend the people, uh, particularly students, uh, who are involved in organizing these talks. Uh, these are, as you know, testing times for all of us with partial and full lockdowns going across the country. And in the middle of all these, it's indeed wonderful to hear some great science through reputed speakers, uh, not only from India, but also from abroad. For the CCMB Biolog series today, we have Professor Michel Rappe from University of California, Berkeley. Uh, it's indeed a great pleasure for me to welcome him on my personal behalf, as well as on behalf of all of us at CCMB. His laboratory over the past 15 years or so has been working in the area of ubiquitin dictated biology by understanding how cellular fates are decided using these systems and their applications in development as well as disease. You know, ubiquitin used to be a small molecule for protein crystallographers like me in the 1990s to understand protein structure and refinement. You know, since it's a small molecule, uh, the computational powers which were available to us those days were less. So we use ubiquitin for understanding structure as well as doing refinement calculations. And the molecule has indeed come a very long way over the past two decades, as you will hear from uh, Professor Rappé's work. I would also like to urge the students who are in the audience to note how Professor Rappé's group employs a multidisciplinary approach by combining genetic, biochemical, and structural principles in elucidating ubiquitination's physiological function. In addition, as I understand, his lab also is involved in developing small molecule modulators for potential therapeutic applications for cancer as well as neurodegenerative diseases using these systems. Uh, with that, I once again welcome Michel to deliver his talk on the code to decide fate. Michelle, the stage is uh, yours now. Perfect. Um, thank you very much. Thank you um, for, the, for the very, very kind invitation. So 
you know, these are, these are difficult times, particularly for you. And so I hope that in the next, you know, 60 minutes or, or however long it'll take, uh, we, we can listen a little bit and talk a little bit about science and that it, uh, you know, um, inspires us for the next, for the next time. So please don't be shy, ask questions, engage, um, be there uh, for the talk that will be the most productive. So um, as, as it was mentioned, my talk, my lab really thinks about how do cells acquire their fate? How do the, seven, the 37 or so trillion cells in our bodies become what they are? And we're not looking at gene expression pathways as most labs do. We look at the post-translational site and use ubiquitin as our like entry point into these questions. And today I want to talk about two slightly related but still difficult different um, aspects of this that we used sort of the role of ubiquitin in differentiation and development uh, to discover new paradigms really of quality control and the mechanisms that make sure that our bodies are robust and that development is robust and that we don't succumb to disease. So um, let me see. Okay, works. So first, a, a you know, short introduction into the ubiquitin pathway, which is sort of at the heart of the talk today. So um, proteins need to be regulated. And in order to do that, ubiquitin is often used now, to get ubiquitin to a substrate, you need very specific enzymes. They are called E3 ligases that select the target for this modification. And then often together with the help of smaller subunits called E2 conjugating enzymes, attach a ubiquitin covalently to the substrate that occurs through a um, isopeptide bond between the C-terminus of ubiquitin and a lysine residue typically in the substrate. Now, Alex Roshevsky actually in the 1980s discovered or realized that ubiquitin has lysine residues itself. And so you could build these ubiquitin chains, which are basically polymeric covalent adducts of ubiquitin. And these chains can be recognized, either a single ubiquitin or these chains can be recognized by effectors that then couple this modification to a particular um, outcome in the cell. And the most famous effector, of course, is the 26 s proteasome, which couples this modification to degradation of the protein. Now, as with every decent modification, this is reversible and you can use de ubiquitinating enzymes to either clip off the ubiquitin signal and terminate the, the pathway or to edit it to really change the connectivity between the ubiquitin molecules. And what makes this pathway so exciting for us and such a great entry point into understanding biology really is that our genomes have dedicated quite some territory to this ubiquitination um, pathway. About 600 genes encode for E3 ligases, at least 100 for de ubiquitinating enzymes and more than 254 effectors. So you know, roughly 5% of your genes are dedicated to either adding, removing, or reading ubiquitin. Now, um, another reason for why we like working on this is that it's a very versatile modification and thereby can control a lot of different aspects of cell behavior. Ubiquitin was originally identified as a simple modification where a single ubiquitin molecule is attached to a substrate. This is called monoubiquitination. The first substrate was a histone protein, H2A. And that typically changes protein interactions. However, as I mentioned, Alex Roshevsky discovered that you can form ubiquitin chains. And depending on the linkage, the lysine residue of ubiquitin that is used for chain formation, um, these are typically using diff or eliciting different outcomes. There are eight potential chains that are described by a prevailing modification, such as the very famous K48-linked ubiquitin chains that drive protein degradation. And then, um, you know, a few years ago, we discovered that you don't have to limit yourself to a single ubiquitin added to another ubiquitin. You can have a ubiquitin molecule modified on more than one lysine residue. This creates a fork structure of branch chains. Um, and these chains, again, encode distinct uh, information. I typically compare the homotypic chains to words in a vocabulary and these branch chains to short sentences that combine different words to um, encode something more precise. Now, the functions that can be elicited by this depend on the effector. Um, often it's associated with protein degradation, um, either through the proteasome or through the autophagy pathway, which is also, if it's substrate specific, often dependent on ubiquitin. But you can also um, do things like change protein interactions, alter protein localization, affect um, the solubility of a protein, affect its catalytic activity. So it's really um, a very precise way of altering the behavior of a modified substrate protein. And not surprisingly, if you have so many genes that have such a biochemical power in the cell, um, many of the responsible enzymes are very important. Some of the most 
you know, you cannot be more essential than being essential, but uh, some of the most important E3 ligases are, uh, or regulators in the cell are E3 ligases, such as the anaphase promoting complex, discovered in part by my postdoc advisor, Mark Kirchner, which um, if you don't have it, you don't even divide a single time. The SCF, um, which we will discuss a lot about today, or Cullen 3, um, which are also essential E3 ligases. Um, on the flip side, mutations in these enzymes cause disease in very many cases. While developmental disease are most interesting for us these days, cancer is probably the most prevalent one. And just to underscore the importance of ubiquitin for preventing tumorigenesis, if you look at all cancers that have been sequenced and you look for the most frequently mutated tumor suppressors, out of the top seven most frequently tumor suppressors, three are actually E3 ligases, showing you how you know, important this pathway is. There are also quite some nasty oncogenes. And actually many years ago, together with John Kurian, we looked at this um, and, and figured that we might be able to uh, use this information in developing new classes of uh, therapies and have been able to um, identify E3 ligases as potential drug targets where we can find small molecules that not only bind to the E3 ligase shown here in gray, but can also recruit substrate proteins this uh, is what's uh, molecular glue, or we call it a molecular glue. This compound here is actually the first prospective molecular glue that was ever found for an E3 ligase and can induce degradation of this oncogenic substrate. This is now a, a pathway called induced protein degradation where protex, meaning uh, combinations of compounds um, that are a little bit easier to get than these molecular glues um, have great promise in the clinic. So ubiquitylation really is a pathway that can elicit many different functions in the cell. And so it's not surprising that it is used for development. And what I want to do today is really illustrate two of these, you know, two aspects of this huge universe of ubiquitylation. Um, and these really uh, both stem from our interest in the function of ubiquitylation in cell fate uh, specification. The first is a new type of quality control that a student of mine, Elijah Mina, discovered about two years ago, and where we now have structural information to understand how it works in atomic detail, that is quality control of complex composition, where um, the cell can detect that a protein complex has the wrong subunits, even though there is no misfolding or no hydrophobic surfaces exposed, there's just somebody at the party who shouldn't be at the party, and the cell can detect this and eliminate this complex. And the second is probably what I consider right now the most important finding of our lab so far is a second, uh, you know, a new stress pathway called the reductive stress response, which we have discovered where ubiquitin is used to allow the cell to monitor the rate of ATP production and the rate of basically the extent of mitochondrial activity in the cell, something that is really at the heart of almost all of life. So let's start with the first story, um, quality control of complex composition. And it's always um, I'm the kind of old guy who's sitting in his office and doesn't do the experiments. And the experiments are run by, you know, an amazing group of graduate students and postdocs in my lab. And this one here, Elijah Mina, was really no exception to this. A graduate student who just graduated and is now at, at Harvard for his, for his postdoctoral thesis. I just want to set, say two things um, in the beginning. He discovered this pathway and took it all the way to the end, even though initially it was really, really hard and no experiment worked for the first two years showing you not only dedication, but also, you know, persistence. And then at the end, luckily, how this paid off into like revealing some beautiful biology. So Elijah's work, he stood on the shoulders of other students in the lab, where um, especially uh, Lin Yang Ying, Achim Werner, and uh, Colleen McGorty, over the years had discovered a pathway that is important for bone formation, particularly in the face and craniofacial development where we had recognized that ubiquitin plays an essential role. There were two E3 ligases called Cullen 3 kbdbd 8 and Cullen 3 calc 12 which were critical for certain steps in this craniofacial developmental pathway. The most interesting was this one here, Cullen 3 kbdbd 8 which controlled the transition of a stem cell, an embryonic stem cell, into another precursor cell called the neural crest cell. Um, this enzyme was interesting for multiple reasons, one of which was the um, biochemistry of it. So um, uh, Colin 3 kbdbd 8 is in its architecture shown here. kbdbd 8 is an adapter protein that recruits the substrate for ubiquitylation and the key substrate here were these two proteins, TCOF1 and NOC1. Um, what is important to note right from the beginning is that it was a homodimer um, that acts as a uh, substrate adapter for this enzyme. You then have a catalytic scaffold that is the Colin uh, protein and then the um, catalytic core 
um, a ring finger protein called RBX1, which binds the E2 enzyme that has an activated form of ubiquitin that can then be transferred to the lysine in these substrates. Now, what was interesting was that these substrates didn't have a single recognition motif for the E3 ligase, but each of these uh, had at least 10 um, recognition motifs that were practically redundant, but you needed at least seven of them to be present in order to recognize, um, be recognized by the E3 ligase, a principle called allovalency um, that makes sure that you can have really precise regulation. What was also interesting was that the outcome was mono ubiquitination, so it was not degradation, and it allowed these proteins TCOF1 and NOC1 to form a platform for the production of new ribosomes. And these new ribosomes were really clever in some sense in that they were preferentially translating proteins that were needed for making neural crest cells. So this showed that by the virtue of ubiquitin, you can change the specificity of ribosomes to drive cell fate specification. So from a biological perspective, this enzyme was really interesting as well. But what made it most interesting for a lab that is interested in, in sort of translating our findings into the clinic was that it had very clear links to disease. Mutations in the substrate that reduce the number of these degrons and, and therefore eliminate ubiquitin lead to lower numbers of neural crest cells and cells in, this, in, in, in patients. And this causes a uh, craniofacial disease called Trichocolin syndrome. On the flip side, mutations in the promoter of KPDVD8, which cause prolonged expression of this protein, cause aberrant neural crest specification at times of development when you don't want to have this. And this is an important driver event for melanoma, which is a neural crest derived cancer. So too little ubiquitilation gives you a developmental disease, too much ubiquitilation gives you cancer. So you have to get it just right. And so this was the question with Elisha, with which Elisha started. How does the cell make sure that this enzyme, KBDBD8 colon three, is actually activated at the right time, the right place, and to the right extent in development? Now, KBDBD8, it's a horrible name, but it contains these three letters, BTB, and that uh, means that it falls into a large class of, of proteins in the human genome that all have a so-called BTB domain. It's a modular domain that is basically plug and play um, uh, in, in many different uh, regulators. About half of them, about 100 or so of these BTB domain proteins are E3 ligase subunits, and they all function in the context of column 3 ligases and dedicate specificity uh, of this column 3 machinery. About 100 others of these BTB proteins are transcription factors. And like the uh, E3 ligase subunits, these are very important transcription factors for development, such as BCL6 or BAC1, for example. The key sort of feature of these BTB domains in this context is really that it mediates homodimerization. Um, if it would heterodimerize, the protein complex would be inactive, but the BTB domain um, typically uh, mediates homodimerization. Um, so um, Elijah actually very early on in his project tried to expand away from, from KBDBD8 and rather than asking only how KBDBD8 is regulated, can we find mechanisms that really control this whole family of proteins that have this BTB domain? And so he used a unbiased large scale proteomic approach for this. Um, and in that huge data set that he found, he, he found something very, very golden. Um, in fact, the regulator of these BTB domains, another E3 lag is called SCF-FBXL17. Now, in this case, FBXL17, again, is the adapter that uh, defines substrate specificity and actually directly binds to BTB domains. Um, it connects through an intermediary protein to a Cullen 1 scaffold, and that, again, has an RBX1 and E2 catalytic center that leads to polyubicotylation in this case and proteosomal degradation of this BTB domain. Now, um, the identification of FBXL17 was actually quite straightforward, but it was much more difficult for Elijah was trying to understand when this protein is active. You couldn't simply degrade all BTB proteins at the same time. This would mean that the cells don't have, that the organisms don't have all these important regulators and they would simply die. So there had to be a layer of specificity that, that def, uh, determined when and where these BTB domain containing proteins were degraded. And we addressed this through reconstitution. These were the two years of experiments that didn't work initially, but at the end actually paid off very nicely. And I just wanna show you the one experiment that defines how this enzyme works. And that came after many experiments, as I said, that did not work and that step-by-step step led us to this point. We realized that these BTB domains, as I mentioned, are functional as homodimers. But because the dimerization interface is fairly small, there is not enough space in evolution to create 
200 completely different homodimers that would never intermix and form these heterodimers. So if you look in cells, you can actually see these heterodimers emerge and they are also very, very stable with affinities in the picomolar range. Now, Elijah built a cassette module where he could like um, synthesize complexes of defined composition. Actually, it's very easy. Uh, when you look at the structure, you can link covalently the two subunits together and therefore just through induced proximity basically make sure that you either form homodimers um, or heterodimers depending on what you mix. So he then built an assay where he has the homodimers here on the side and then in the middle he always loaded the respective heterodimers in the different orientations and he asked whether either homo or heterodimers are bound by this um, E3 ligase in a pull down experiment. And I hope what you can you know, realize here is that the specificity was really mind blowing and that homodimers were not recognized, but heterodimers were very efficiently and very nicely bound by this E3 ligase. This was the first example of an enzyme that can distinguish complexes solely based on uh, composition. And you know, it didn't really matter what the BTB domain was that we used it. He tested 80, I think 80 combinations at the end of the day, thanks to reviewer number three. Um, and uh, this principle held up in all of these cases. So based on this work, which is all has been published a long time ago, uh, we proposed this mechanism of dimerization quality control, where FPXL17 can distinguish complexes based on whether they are homodimeric and functional, and they're you know, kept intact, or whether they are heterodimeric and dysfunctional. And only if it recognizes these heterodimeric complexes, it would recognize it ubiquitinated and degraded so that the cell would only contain functional BTP pro domain containing proteins. And this mechanism was actually essential for nervous uh, system development, both the central nervous system, as well as the peripheral nervous system, which contains these neural crest cells, which were the starting point for this project. But of course, you know, as with any good project, this raised many more questions that we, than what we answered actually. And some of them are shown here. How can a single E3 ligase, you know, detect about 20,000 potential substrates? That's what you get if you, come, if you pair 200 domains with each other, um, while not discover, you know, binding to anything in the genome and most importantly, not binding to these homodimers. Um, making this a bigger problem, some of these complexes will have the same subunits, only that there is one copy of the subunit in this complex that's recognized and two in the uh, complex that's not recognized. So how can an enzyme maintain the specificity in one hand and versatility on the other side that it can recognize up to 20,000 specific substrates? And we realized that in order to address this, we really needed to learn how to do structural biology. And I said, I, John Corian is a very good friend of mine, but before this, we really never had done any crystal structures or, or any other structural biology. Whenever we needed help, we asked Sean. In this case, Elijah really went out and did all of this by himself. He wouldn't have been able to do this without John Corian, who really opened his lab very, very generously, taught us. <laughs> and you know, we were taught by, by a true giant here and, and uh, helped us in any imaginable way. But you know, it was really a testament to Elijah after he discovered this, showed that it's important for nervous system development in frogs, now went all the way to learn the structural biology. He basically used two approaches. The first was um, cryo-EM, where he purified the whole complex, actually, um, of the E3 ligase. And then he mixed it with dimeric keep one that uh, is a BTB domain containing protein that we used as a substrate. This substrate here is a mutant form of, BT of this keep one, which basically behaves like a heterodimer. It's a little trick that we can use that makes the structural biology easier. We mix the substrate with the enzyme, stabilize it, and then solve um, a fairly low resolution cryo-EM structure. Um, but actually had many um, you know, interesting features. The most striking feature, um, two of them, the one was we saw you know, the enzyme in orange here, FPXL17 binds to the BTB domain and keep one. That was nice. We saw our specificity was correct, but the catalytic core of the enzyme is here. And that actually is exposed to a completely different domain of the substrate. So this is an example where an E3 ligase binds one domain, but actually ubiquitinates another domain. That's very important for us as we think about tuning the system for drug discovery. We don't really need to worry about lysine residues close to substrate binding sites. We need to worry about lysine residues close to catalytic sites. Um, the other thing, and the much more striking one, of course, was that even we looked very, very hard for finding the second molecule of KEEP1, we really only found a monomer in this complex. So remember, we put in a picomolar dimeric complex, mixed it. All we did was mixing, but in the structure, we only saw a single molecule. That, of course, was very mind-blowing. That was very surprising. Um, the 
resolution, unfortunately, was not good enough that we could use this to do really mechanistic analyses of complex formation and ask what, what is the significance of this uh, monomeric substrate here. And so Elijah had to repeat, you know, go back to zero, now learn crystal structure, X-ray crystallography. Uh, he could focus on just the specificity domain, which is FBXL17, and it's one partner skip one, which we need for solubility, and really just the BTB domain. And again, he uses uh, a mutant BTB domain. He purified it as a dimer, picomolar affinity from bacteria. He mixes them, purifies back the complex that he gets by gel filtration, and solves the 2.7 angstrom resolution structure by X-ray crystallography. And, and that, you know, was again, it was a very beautiful structure. Um, I mean, it was the first structure that we solved by X-ray crystallography, so I'm biased, I find it extremely beautiful. But uh, the um, biggest take-home of the structure, one of the take-homes was there was only a single molecule of the BTP domain in there. You put something in a dimer, um, pick a molar affinity, but you get out a monomer. That was strange. The other thing that we saw is that um, it really is a steric three-dimensional Degron. It's not a sequence-based Degron. You see how the E3 ligase, which has these loose and rich repeats, really wraps around the BTB domain. And then at its C-terminus, it has what we call a C-terminal helix or a CTH, which basically closes the hug. So what this E3 ligase monitors is the shape um, of the BTB domain, not a particular sequence. And that explains to some extent why it can detect, you know, 200 different BTB domains or potentially 20,000 complexes of BTP domains because they all will have the same shape even though they you know, vary dramatically in sequence. Um, we could explain now why there was only a monomer because when you looked at the BTP domain and, and on the right side here is the dimer uh, that we typically see as the functional unit. And green is one subunit and turquoise the other. And you see that the C-terminal helix or the CTH of FBXL17 really sits right smack in the place where the other dimer subunit was. So you can either bind FBXL17 or <laughs> another dimer subunit, but not both at the same time, at least in the final stage of the reaction that we visualize here in these structures. So this really um, suggested to us that there are two possibilities. Either this is an E3 ligase that waits until the BTB domain dissociates spontaneously. Um, and that was problematic for us because we looked at this very hard and we found that there is no dissociation that we can measure in chase assays within like 24 hours. That would be a very inefficient uh, E3 ligase. Or it has an active function actually dismantling these complexes. And so we could test this. Elisha built this um, FRET fluorescence um, resonance energy transfer assay where he labeled two different subunits with different fluorophores. And if we lose dimerization, if we turn it into monomer, we should see that the donor fluorescence in this case, this Alexa 555 should go up. And so um, when we incubate this substrate with FBXL17, indeed, that's what we see, the donor fluorescence increases, which is an indication that now we have only monomers uh, bound to FBXL17. And what was very important was the observation if we add what we call a sink, a very large excess of a BTB domain, the same BTB domain, the same mutations that are unlabeled, uh, which could basically get, bind anything that just dissociates spontaneously, we do not see this uh, happening. And if we mutate the C-terminal helix of FBXL17, we also do not see this complex dismantling, suggesting that FBXL17 really has a more active role in dismantling these complexes. And indeed, I, I won't show you the data. We think it initially binds the dimer, destabilizes the interface a little bit, and then allows the C-terminal helix to eject one of the binding partners out of this complex. And so, of course, so it, 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 there was a second aspect for specificity in that, in addition to shape, it also checks the stability, whether it can actually disrupt those complexes. But that wasn't enough for us to uh, understand how it can distinguish between a homodimer, which it should bind but not dismantle, and a heterodimer, which it should bind and dismantle. So there had to be some sequence element, some structural element that actually allows FBXL17 to make this distinction. And that actually came from another structure that Elijah um, solved. He was now on a run now that he had uh, learned how to do X-ray crystallography. And so he solved simply the BTB structure of his mutant protein. That was his substrate that we put in. And these BTB domains, these structures had been solved before, of course, but um, there is a, a very nice feature in those structures. And that is that um, there is a beta sheet that is formed between a beta strand of one subunit, the blue here, and a beta strand of the other subunit, the gray here. So this is an inter molecular beta sheet. When you bind this domain to FBXL17, this beta strand here will fold over into this position 
so that you now form an intramolecular beta sheet. So this is an example of three-dimensional domain swapping. When we looked at the sequence in heterodimers that we would model, so this is a model of a heterodimer between two BTP domains, we saw that particular in the position of this um, beta strand, as well as in what we call the hinge that basically places this beta strand into the right position, that's where we saw clashes uh, for heterodimers, suggesting that a heterodimer might actually displace this beta strand. And so we wanted to test whether this is at the heart of distinction that you know, these beta strands are in a locked position for homodimers where they can form and might not be allowing recognition by FPXL17, and they might be in an uh, open position for heterodimers where they could not form this intermolecular beta strand. And so we tested this in a, in a simple experiment where we can focus on one of these beta strands in a dimer. Uh, we can either have it in a heterodimer where it's in the open conformation, or we made a swap where we took just the sequence of this amino term, amino terminal beta strand and replaced it by the sequence that would be there for a homodimer, but everything else would be a heterodimer basically. And we asked if this is really determining specificity, this little swap here should make sure that this uh, now heterodimeric protein is not recognized by the E3 ligase. That <laughs> actually worked. Um, this is the experiment. We have here um, FPXL17 bound to beads. We look for binding. This is the heterodimer between two BDB domains and it's really, really nicely bound. This is the homodimer and it's not bound at all. Uh, and now we make these swaps and the one swap is, is shown here with, where we displace the um, hinge region and the beta strand, basically allowing the beta strand to be in position, even though everything else is a heterodimer. And this heterodimeric protein with just this amino terminal lock in place is not recognized anymore. We can do the opposite experiments. We can do a homodimer, make mutations here in the sequence to open it up and suddenly the homodimer is recognized as well. And that's really cool from an evolutionary perspective. Here we labeled evolutionary rates onto our structure and the fastest evolving sequence in all BTB domains is this amino terminal beta strand. In fact, uh, you have 200 BTB domains, about 220. There, this beta strand is about five residues long. There is not a single one that's identical across these 200 BTB domains, which is, I think, amazing from an evolutionary perspective. And so we call this molecular barcode for BTB dimerization that allows FPXL17 to distinguish whether you have a homodimer where this is in the locked position or a heterodimer where this is you know, displaced, open, and now qualifies this BTB domain for degradation. Anyway, so this is basically complementarity um, as a third principle of defining specificity. So just to um, summarize this, work started totally from the developmental side, went all the way to biophysics and structures and uh, led to a model where we can understand how uh, this quality control machinery works. In a homodimer, there is a barcode that's set in place and prevents recognition. But in the heterodimer, this sequence is displaced. You have an open conformation. This allows FPXL17 initially to bind to the heterodimer and then the C-terminal helix to displace a subunit so that this bound subunit can be ubiquitinated and degraded. And of course, this monomeric subunit here will be uh, basically wiped up by another FPXL17 subunit and ubiquitinated and degraded very, very quickly. So from a bigger perspective, there were a few take-home lessons that were interesting here. One was, as I mentioned, ubiquitination sites are not necessarily in the domains that are recognized by an E3 ligase. They can be in different domains of the enzyme. Um, substrate specificity is not necessarily defined by a sequence, a you know, two-dimensional sequence, but it can be defined by um, properties such as shape, where it wraps around it, or a complementarity defined by the, you know, this barcode sequence. And then, of course, as a lab, you don't like projects that are over. Um, there's also the um, big, you know, issue of prevalence. Is this a single um, example of complex composition quality control, or is this basically a sign for something bigger? And I, I, I am very happy to report that we now have at least two, if not three other examples of quality control of complex composition, suggesting that the ubiquitin pathway has found many ways to actually look at um, you know, whether complexes have the right subunits in cells and make sure that you only form functional signaling um, modalities. So that was one example. Um, the one that, that uh, we're very actively working on now is, is another example of that illustrates really nicely how specificity in the system is defined. And that is our recently discovered reductive stress response. And again, this is the work of an amazing group of people, uh, particularly a postdoc in the lab, Andrew Manford, who really discovered this machine and now is the leader of this team. Um, he um, mentors graduate students such as Fernando Rodriguez Perez, who just 
graduated from the lab and, and uh, now is doing his postdoc in Vishwa Dixit's lab at Genentech. Um, and now our newest students that uh, joined the lab all joined because of Andrew, because they wanted to work on, on this reductive stress response. Um, basically, the question that was at the heart of, of Andrew's work is, how can we make sure that development is robust? We face a lot of adverse conditions, you know, limitations in nutrition, high temperatures, exposure to chemicals that can be detected by a stress response. They can be sensed. And then the stress responses um, basically set in motion um, uh, signaling pathways that take care um, of these, these bad conditions and alleviate them. And through this, um, they really ensure organismal homeostasis. Now, these stress responses have been described many, many years ago, and they've typically seen as diseases of aging. Um, if you have, for example, protein misfolding, you detect it and you bring in chaperones that take care of this. And if you lose that response, um, you will get protein aggregation and neurodegeneration. However, once people have taken these stress responses apart a little bit more genetically and knocked out um, components in, in, in animals, they found that you had phenotypes already very early in development, meaning that these stress responses are important for tissue formation as well. And how the developmental function of stress responses is really very poorly understood. Um, one example is the oxidative stress response, which is one of the best characterized stress responses. That's when you have too many reactive oxygen species that could oxidize proteins or lipids or DNA, and that would be very deleterious for your organism. That's sensed by an E3 ligase called Cullen 3 keep one That's actually the same keep one that we used as a substrate for our dimerization quality control stuff. Um, what basically happens is that these reactive oxygen species oxidize a cysteine residue or multiple cysteine residues in KEEP1, and that inhibits this E3 ligase. The inhibition of this E3 ligase leads to stabilization of an effector, which is called NRF2, which then sets in motion a transcriptional program that brings about uh, a lot of antioxidant signaling. Now, if you have uh, inactivation of this pathway, you're really prone to diseases of aging, such as lung cancer or neurodegeneration. But if you mutate KEEP1 during development, you again have a very early phenotype, namely perinatal death, suggesting that it plays an important role in development as well. And again, this developmental role was completely not sure, not understood, but it was clear that understanding sort of these stress responses, if they you know, are misregulated, has very striking and bad consequences for an organism. So when Andrew came, um, we had two opportunities, or two, two possibilities. He could either study something like this, oxidative stress response, and finally understand why it's important for development, or he finds his own stress response in order to study that further. And we decided to go for the second question because this is a very heavily trodden pathway here and it's better to find your own niche when you start out. And so in order to do so, Andrew focused on myogenesis as a developmental pathway because we know this is um, very much uh, regulated by stress. You know, you go to the gym in order to exert stress on your muscle <laughs> and that induces myogenesis, hopefully if you do it right. And so that can stimulate myogenesis. On the flip side, if you don't eat well, that actually, if you starve, that actually can have very early consequences on muscle formation. So nutritional stress or fasting is known to reduce this program very well. So it's a basically a developmental paradigm regulated by stress, the perfect thing for us. So Andrew built an image-based screening platform, his RNA screening platform, and he basically looked for um, enhancers or inhibitors of myogenesis. And because we are very narrow in our view of the world, we focused on E3 ligases or ubiquitylation enzymes in this, in this screen. And we were really struck when we found KEEP1, this oxidative stress sensor, as a very strong negative regulator, um, positive regulator of myogenesis. So if you lose KEEP1, you don't get myotubes. And that's shown here. Myotubes are, are uh, shown in green that we can make in vitro. And if you don't have this oxidative stress sensor, there's really no myotube. Now, in a normal situation in stress, you have a temporary event. You have temporary inactivation of KEEP1 that leads to temporary nerve 2 stabilization and basically antioxidant signaling. If you do that genetically, it's persistent. And that means that you, uh, when you knock out KEEP1, you get very long stabilization of nerve 2 that gives you a lot of glutathione, a lot of um, you know, antioxidant signaling, and that can actually scavenge reactive oxygen species that have a physiological function. It was known since 1987 that these ROS or reactive oxygen species are important for signaling, but what they actually do in the cell and how cells maintain the proper levels was not really clear. But if you basically deplete KEEP1, you scavenge these reactive oxygen species and that causes another stress that's called reductive stress. 
And so we asked whether it was really reductive stress that caused, or the reductive stress response that caused this blockade in, in myogenesis. And you can test this very simply. Um, if persistent nerve two stabilization is the origin of this block in differentiation, if you deplete nerve two together with keep one, you should be able to rescue myogenesis. And that's what you get 100%. We actually could take it one step further if you take down targets of nerve two as a transcription factor, it has hundreds of targets, but the antioxidant ones are probably the important ones for this. If we get rid of, for example, enzymes of glutathione oxidation uh, production, you could also rescue um, this keep one depletion 100%. So it basically told us it was reductive stress that blocked um, differentiation into myotubes. Reductive stress, as I said, is when cells have not enough reactive oxygen species, when they are lacking the reactive oxygen species that are important for signaling. That can happen actually quite a lot. It can happen when you don't eat well, when glycolysis runs out of steam. That's one possibility. When the electron transport chain, uh, when mitochondria are inactivated, that's probably the most physiological reason. But it also happens when you have mutations in KEEP1, for example, or mutations in proteins that sequester KEEP1 away from, from its binding partner. And if this is unmitigated, it's not only leading to cancer, um, actually, mutations in KEEP1 are the uh, leading cause of lung adenocarcinoma, one of the worst lung cancers, but it can also lead to cardiomyopathy or diabetes. So reductive stress is pretty bad, yet still we didn't know how the cells could deal with it. Basically, what is the reductive stress response? How can you detect and alleviate it was unclear. And, and that was what Andrew realized what was really brilliant. He saw that he now had a system at his disposal where he could discover the components of the reductive stress response. Again, it's a very simple genetic experiment. If we don't have KEEP1, we induce reductive stress and we activate this response and we don't get myogenesis. Now, if we mutate a component of this reductive stress response uh, together with KEEP1, we should again rescue it, just as we did with the nerve 2 co depletion, as I showed you. So, oops. Do you still see my... I don't know what happened here. Yeah, yeah, we see the slide, yeah. We see the slide, just that it's not, in, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. back to normal. Great. Sorry that the, my, my, my keynote acted up. So, so basically we did a genetic modifier screen where we looked for rescue of myogenesis in the absence of KEEP1. And he got one really nice hit, which turned out to be an E3 ligase. And it was even better than that. It was an E3 ligase that we had seen before, FEM1B, which in our original screen, uh, scored at the complete opposite of KEEP1. So loss of oxidative stress response interferes with myogenesis. Loss of this candidate reductive stress response regulator gives you apparently more myotubes. And just to show you the data, which is really beautiful, if you deplete FEM1B, you massively stimulate myogenesis. So it's the opposite of losing KEEP1, just as you regulate the opposite in terms of molecules. KEEP1 recognizes too many reactive oxygen species that recognizes too few of them, it's the opposite. And if you combine these two, um, you rescue both phenotypes 100%. So they seem to be different sides of a, of, a, of a balancing stress response. Now that meant we had a good entry point. It seemed like we had the first entry into the reductive stress response and it seemed to be an E3 ligase. Of course, to understand it further, we needed to get the substrate. And for that, we typically do um, mass spec. In this case, the ligase FEM1B, which was our screen hit, is again an adapter. It's again of a Cullen ring ligase. Now it's Cullen 2. So you get hopefully not too much confused about all these different Cullen names. It's basically you know, exchangeable. It brings in a catalytic domain here, an E2 enzyme, and it catalyzes polyupecotylation and degradation. In order to find the substrate, you cannot simply IP FEM1B because it would degrade the substrate. So you have to use a little trick. The trick we do is we mutate the binding site of FEM1B that is used to incorporate into the ligase. So you can still bind substrate, but you cannot ubiquitilate it. And you can simply ask what protein is enriched in the complexes of this mutant. And there were a few shown here and the killer here was really this protein FNP1. I just walk you through the actual data of it here. In the input, you see a little bit of FNP1. If you induce the ligase, that goes away. Um, we then spent um, about a year or so to make a few mutants um, that disrupt substrate binding, but not formation of the ligase, so not folding. And if you have the substrate binding mutant, you do not see this drop in activity. And if you have the um, trap that we used, you actually get even a little increase. And so the wild type FEM1B can bind FNP1 very nicely. The substrate binding mutant does not bind it at all. And the trap binds it a little bit better. That's how we identified FNP1. 
And we basically then used genetics to test all sorts of candidate substrates we had in order to figure out which one is the essential one. And it turned out, as I said, FNP1. And you can, again, see it in these like simple experiments. If you um, deplete FEM1B, you get more muscle. Um, if this is because you accumulate FNP1, you should rescue it by co-depletion of FNP1 in this background. And this is shown here, where again, we completely rescue it. So we knew this one substrate was the essential target of this E3 ligase in this context of reductive stress. So we could add that um, into the game. And it's not 100% important yet what FNP1 is, just for, for the sake of it, take this as the, as the substrate. So if you think of a stress response, it of course should only be set in motion when there is the stress. And in our case means when you have too few reactive oxygen species. For the oxidative stress response, as I mentioned initially, it's oxidation of cysteine residues in KEEP1 through these reactive oxygen species, which inhibit this E3 ligase. What happens here, we had no clue. In order to figure this one out, the first thing that we had to do is we had to understand how the substrate binds to the ligase. So we had to find a sequence that we call a Degron, which is basically the specificity component of the substrate to the ligase. That required a lot of mutagenesis. It's a large, large protein. It has a constitutive binding partner called folliculin. If you lose constitutive binding, you're unfolding and it's, it's a mess. So, so teasing this apart was very difficult, but Karen Shi in the lab over more than a year was able to take this apart. And she was successful in identifying a just 20 amino acid stretch, which was both required and uh, sufficient actually for E3 ligase binding and degradation. In order to show this sufficiency, we build an assay system that is sort of built on, on a lot of work that Steve Allich in Boston had done. He calls it GPS, where he fuses um, a protein whose you know, stability is interested into GFP and then expresses a red fluorescent protein from an uh, internal ribosome exit site. So basically you transfect this plasmid into cells. You always get a ratio of GFP to m cherry. And that ratio is really defined only by the stability of the GFP as it's modulated by the Degron. So when we use the FNP1 Degron, this 20 residues in this sequence, um, we get a certain in the green curve here, which is a certain ratio of GFP to RFP. If we then turn on the E3 ligase, this shifts to the red curve, it shifts to the left, and that means you have less GFP in the cell, meaning you're degrading this GFP fusion. And this was dependent on the Degron. If we didn't have the Degron, this wouldn't happen. Um, we can also bring in the substrate binding mutant. We don't see the shift or the substrate, uh, the trap, the catalytic mutant, and we don't see the shift. So it's really specific dependent on ubiquitylation. And in fact, we can do it the other way around. We can simply delete FEMON-B using CRISPR-Cas9. And there we see that the curve shifts to the right, um, which means um, uh, that now you have stabilization of the protein. And actually, when you look at the ratios here, you can immediately suggest how much of the protein is degraded at a time. We know that about 80% is stable in a normal cell and only 20% under normal conditions is susceptible to degradation. And we know that that is because, you know, 80% are oxidized uh, in a particular sequence, as you'll see in a second. So now we had the Degron. So we knew, and, and that typically then allows us to ask, is there any regulation around it? And for that, we typically do sequence gazing first and ask, is there anything interesting? You look at conserved residues. There are three residues that are conserved across all FNP1 homologs. And these three residues are three cysteines. And so if you talk about the redox sensing pathway and the three conserved residues are cysteines, you know that something nice has happened. And so the first thing we asked, of course, is are these cysteine residues essential for a Degron function? And they are beautifully. In the top curve here, we see the normal Degron and how it's degraded in this fax assay. Then we use the E3 ligase, we see the shift to the left. In the bottom curve, we mutate these three cysteine residues. We get first a shift to the right, which is practically the same as what we had seen in the delta FEM1B mutant. Uh, but now induction of the E3 ligase FEM1B doesn't cause any degradation anymore. So these three cysteine residues are essential in the cell. If you have a normal cell, what was really interesting is that they are oxidized. They form a disulfide bond between this cysteine here and either that or that cysteine. So in a normal dividing cell, you have a Degron that is oxidized. Um, and that raised the possibility that when it's oxidized, it might not be recognized by the E3 ligase. But when you have reductive stress, you run out of reactive oxygen species. That's the characteristic of reductive stress. Maybe that oxidation is reversed and maybe that allows recognition by the E3 ligase. And so in order to test this, we did a simple but very convincing biophysical assay. We used the peptide that contains the Degron. We put a fluorophore to it so we can monitor fluorescence polarization as a measure of binding. We titrate 
um, the femon B ligase into this. And uh, first we do it as good biochemists in the presence of a reducing agent TCP. And we see this nice binding curve. We get an affinity of about 50 to 60 nanomolar in the best conditions that we now have. Then for a minute, we forget our biochemical training. We completely ignore biochemistry 101 classes and we take up this um, peptide um, in the absence of a reducing agent. And we just do this for 30 seconds or a minute. And even under those conditions, there's absolutely no binding to the E3 ligase anymore. Now we remembered that in order to do biochemistry, you should add reducing agents. So we took these samples and added reducing agents to those samples and remeasured them again. And that's the red curve. And we completely instigated uh, binding. So it showed us very convincingly that, um, you know, reducing conditions are needed for recognition. Normally this thing is oxidized, but under reductive stress it becomes reduced and that might trigger ubiquitin uh, binding by the ligase. And in fact, we can look at this in cells. Here in green is um, the normal uh, degradation as we measured in our effects assay. If we impose reductive stress, either by um, shutting down mitochondria or by um, inhibiting keep one, which was our initial conduct, um, then we see that we get degradation. That's because these cysteines become reduced. Um, we can also impose more oxidative stress, and then we can actually see some stabilization as well, because now these cysteines are completely oxidized um, in cells. And uh, we went a step further and uh, wanted to understand how this works structurally. Um, it was again Elijah who did this sort of on the side while he worked on his dimerization quality control together with Andrew. They solved the crystal structure of the E3 ligase bound to this Fnipon decron, and it turned out to be an absolutely surprising but beautiful mechanism of recognition. Normally, when two proteins interact with each other, um, you see um, side chain interactions between the different partners. In this case, that's very you know, practically not the case. There are a few, but, but they're not important. What happens is that these three cysteine residues that we found through our mutagenesis, and they're absolutely conserved, basically chelate two zinc atoms, and they partner with this with histidine and cysteine residues of the E3 ligase. And the zinc basically is molecular glue, Velcro, between the substrate and the E3 ligase. And of course, zinc can only be chelated if you have reduced cysteine residues. It cannot be chelated if these cysteine residues are oxidized or engaged in a disulfide bond. Showing you how reduction of those cysteine residue creates a condition that allows the E3 ligase and the substrate to come together with the help of two interface uh, zinc atoms. And this very surprising mechanism of recognition turned out to be the case or important both in vitro and in vivo. We can measure this very easily. In vitro, if we chelate the zinc, there is no binding whatsoever. So it's absolutely dependent on zinc. In vivo, if we chelate the zinc, there is no degradation whatsoever. And we know this is um, you know, specific in this case, we've made many controls. So there is a zinc dependent mechanism of an E3 ligase where zinc really acts as a molecular glue that allows the enzyme in this case, only to recognize the reduced, but not the oxidized form of the substrate. So we had the regulation in this pathway, which was neat. Um, and it, it suggested that, you know, reductive stress causes a reduction of residues in the substrate that are typically oxidized. And this reduction event allows the E3 ligase to recognize its substrate. And so the final thing was, what does it do? Well, most of the reactive oxygen species are produced by mitochondria. So we looked at mitochondria. We did this by various means. I just show you two. One, which is really, I think, nice to illustrate is uh, by transmission electron microscopy, where we normally see mitochondria as these beanbags with a criste uh, in between where the electron transfer chain sits. If you lose the substrate, they actually get bigger. And that's interesting in itself. But what was more dramatic is if you lose the ligase and you get more of this protein, more of the substrate, uh, now the uh, mitochondria turn pitch black. This was a phenotype observed in the 1960s and it's called matrix condensation. And it happens when mitochondria run out of substrate for the electron transport chain. And in fact, we had two other phenotypes that confirmed this. One was these onion mitochondria, which is basically hyperproliferation of, of Criste, which is an attempt of mitochondria to activate the electron transport chain by simply making more enzyme. Um, and the third is um, in, induction of mitophagy, which happens if you don't have the electron transport chain running and the mitochondrial membrane potential breaks down, then you start degrading these mitochondria. So it seemed that the substrate and the stability of the substrate regulated mitochondrial activity. And in fact, we know that these phenotypes are all only because this one substrate is stabilized because everything could be restored 
to normal by just co-depleting this one substrate flip one. And in fact, we can look directly at um, reactive oxygen species. We do this with an indicator assay. And as seen with the TM assays, if you lose the ligase, you don't produce any reactive oxygen species anymore. And you can completely uh, rescue this by co-depleting the substrate. And we can look at this also on the mechanistic angle. How is this happening? And it turned out that what the system regulates is metabolite import into mitochondria. If you have no, if you have reductive stress and you degrade FNP1, you um, import more metabolites into mitochondria so that the TCA cycle can produce substrate for the electron transport chain, which in turn will make reactive oxygen species. So to summarize all of this, um, this I think is another example where a, a discovery of a D3 ligase told us a lot about my um, uh, biology in this case, um, how the redox system or the redox balance is established in the cell. Um, you have the substrate FNP1, which in normal cells is oxidized because reactive oxygen species coming from mitochondria will lead to disulfide bond formation here. If these electron transport chains are inactive because mitochondria, for example, have no fuel to burn, these uh, cysteines will be reduced. In this reduced state, the ligase will be recognized by, um, uh, the substrate will be recognized by fem one b through these intermediary zinc atoms that leads to degradation of FNP1. And the consequence of this is that cells uh, import uh, metabolites into mitochondria so that the um, electron transport chain can produce ROS to basically alleviate the reductive stress. And uh, there are a few things that are interesting. One of the striking ones is, um, I think this is now the third pathway that sort of controls um, redox potential in the cell, the redox system, the redox state. There is the very famous hypoxic stress response discovered by Bill Kalin and Radcliffe. Um, which goes through an E3 ligase and the HIF-1 transcription factor. There's the oxidative stress response that I mentioned, and now the reductive stress response. And I think if you look at it particularly in the way, in the very biased way, how I uh, you know, was, was sh are showing it here, it really looks pretty much the same for all these three uh, stress responses. You always use a column-based E3 ligase, and you always uh, regulate it through some um, oxidation event, which then leads to some effector event that is really geared directly towards the source of your stress. So it seems that culinary ring ligase is in the ubiquitin system as, uh, in itself is a very adaptable way of like monitoring stress or monitoring um, changes in your environment and adapting to that. And now for us, again, this is, a, this is somewhat of a gold mine. We're very excited about this. There are many open questions that come from this. The most important one is how is FNP1 degradation actually regulated? What is really measured? Um, how does it function? How does it regulate metabolite import into mitochondria? We have no idea. And where is this actually happening in the cell or in, in, in animals? Uh, we're very interested in the physiology. We've now made knockout mice, of the, knockout mice of this. And so we try to understand how does this sort of mitochondrial tuning, as we call it, um, regulate development? And, and basically, is this function in metabolic control um, really at the heart of the developmental function? Is the stress function only an adaptation to that? And then most importantly, we try to translate this into new classes of E3 ligase activators for small molecules to basically take this really powerful stress response E3 ligase into a very good um, drug target uh, for treating either um, actually metabolic diseases or neurodegenerative diseases. And so with this, I, I, I'd like to close. I hope I was not too long. I'm sorry, I was too long, but um, I hope it was not too bad. But um, I would like to close by thanking really the people behind it. Um, the, the masterminds here was Elijah, who was amazing, and his work on the dimer station quality control, and then Andrew, who really opened a new field of biology with the reductive stress response. They didn't work alone. They had many collaborators in the lab. It's one of the foundations of my lab that people come together and work together to you know, address the sometimes difficult problems that we're facing. And of course, they had many in, 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 in these stories. And, and as I mentioned, Andrew is building more and more a larger and larger subgroup in the lab uh, interested in reductive stress signaling. We also benefited greatly from advice and help from people in Berkeley, most importantly in this case, John Kurian, and, and, and also Ivan Ogales, who really taught us uh, crystallography and cryo-EM and were extremely generous in their resources. Richard Harlan uh, helped us uh, with all the frog work that we're doing. Uh, and then um, we, we had many other uh, groups that helped us. And then of course, um, the funders that pay for actually all of our endeavors and our fun. And so with this, um, I'd like to close again. Thank you very much for, for um, inviting me here today. And please 
please ask questions uh, um, and, and, you know, engage. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Professor Rappi. The experiments were beautiful. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah. So it was a fascinating uh, talk, Michelle. Uh, it was great. Uh, and also, you know, if I may call particularly regarding the first part of your talk, it's nice to see how this domain jugglery that happens, you know, uh, between these very, very near uh, recognizing systems and how they can distinguish. Uh, I have uh, actually a couple of questions. Uh, if Somdata, if I can go first. Uh, sure. uh, yeah. Uh, you know, so I was really fascinated by this reductive stress response because it's generally a bit counterintuitive uh, to think of a reductive stress. And that too, uh, when it came to the uh, you know, mechanistic mode of operation, uh, you mentioned that uh, they go through cysteine, histidine kind of interaction of a zinc, correct? Uh, normally, if you have such coordinations as we know from protein structures, uh, they are reasonably tight, correct? So they are not that modulated, as you may know. Uh, that many of these zinc binding modules that use cysteine and histidine are reasonably tight because otherwise they lose their interaction. And since you are talking about a very, very uh, subtle alteration of the stress, because you have to really figure out that you are changing the reductive you know, stress or the oxidative uh, you know, impact is changing and these systems have to respond quickly. Uh, how will this kind of a uh, zinc-based interaction, which is expected to be tight, would be involved in such kind of subtle discrimination? Yeah. So, so what we think, I think this is a you know a, a very important question, a very good question, and we are very excited by this question. Um, what we do think is happening that, in fact, in order to form, in this case, the E3 ligase substrate complex, you need help. And so it's known that on uh, mitochondrial surfaces, for example, or the in, in the um, intermembrane space, there are quite a few metal chaperones that um, help load um, metals into those complexes, and that mm -hmm. can help reshape sort of how the metals are coordinated. So we do think that in order to form this complex, you need an extra um, enzymatic activity, a metal chaperone, basically, which makes sure um, that you form this particular coordination chemistry that, that we see here. Sure. Uh, if I may add, you know, one of the things I am sure you may have possibly looked at is that there are very tight zinc binding modules of this type and very, very rarely you have certain variations in the coordination where the distance particularly of a cysteine changes. So, which means if one of the coordination is quite fragile and that can actually induce the triggering of the dissociation. So, maybe... You, you know, there are these two types, you know, the, but the weakest binding ones are very rare in the you know, literature. So you may have to look at it from that angle and possibly you may find an answer as to which sink possibly is promoting this kind of fragility in the operation. Uh, so that's a very interesting system. Yeah. Uh, the other question that I had is with respect to the first part of your talk, which is on the BTP domains. Uh, you know, you mentioned about this N-terminal fragment, which is highly divergent in terms of its nature, which eventually is involved in dictating these molecular properties of association. Uh, you know, uh, have you looked at when this divergence started in the animal branch? Uh, you know, like say, I think whatever you talked about is majorly from the human system. But if you yeah. go down, uh, you know, how, how far you see that, uh, particularly yeah, this kind of a divergence? The, the, the evolution there is also extremely interesting. It's, it's really fun to look at. We haven't done it as carefully as we probably should have done it. But what I can tell you is that when you go to yeast, for example, mm -hmm. in yeast, you have, I think, seven BTP proteins. And okay. you can sort of form dif different enough dimers that it doesn't really matter all that much. And so there is no FBXL17, like there is no dimerization quality control. You go to Drosophila, where you have about 19 or so. Um, and Drosophila already probably figured out that it should use this mod. It's a modular dimerization domain, right? A dimerization agree, module. It might yeah. use it to bring different proteins together, but it didn't figure out how to bypass the problem of like making different dimers. So mm -hmm. what in Drosophila happens is that Drosophila for a transcription factor takes one BTB domain of one transcription factor and splices it in front of 19 other BTB domains so that it can form 
basically 19 homodimers based on alternative splicing. But that, of course, is also limited. How much sure. alternative splicing sure. can you do? And sure. so in, in vertebrates, that's when we see FPXL17 coming up. And the moment when FPXL17 emerges on the evolutionary landscape, that's when you have this explosion from I see. Seven, okay. 10 uh, BTB domains into 220 BTB domains. So sure. we think that this is really important for evolution, that the evolutionary space is limited and how different you can make those, those dimers. And so the more BTB domains you have, the more examples of aberrant dimers you will have, right? And so Absolutely. Yeah. rather than spending more energy in making these dimers different, the cell simply evolved a degradation system to degrade so sort of the... It's a, it's a vertebrate associated uh, expansion. It, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's that's like, great. Yeah. Uh, I have one quick question that you also mentioned in the passing that uh, there's a ribosome involved specific translation, correct? And, uh, you know, in the first part of your talk, uh, can you just elaborate on that? Because I just couldn't get that. Uh, right. So um, when, when you make neural crest cells, uh, we needed this, this KPDPD8 uh, TCOF1 system and, and um, we found that uh, this was important for ribosome biogenesis. It did not change how many ribosomes you had in the cell, but it did change when we did ribosome profiling, what mRNAs were translated by those ribosomes. Okay. And we now know somewhat the mechanism that is behind it. Um, okay. so, so there is basically at that time of development, there is one big um, decision-making process. You can either go towards neural crest mm -hmm. or you go towards the telencephalon and forebrain fate. And, and so these are the two major things that you have to distinguish. And basically, um, if you have these new ribosomes, they translate neural crest proteins, MRAs just fine. And for the telencephalon ones, there are upstream open reading frames that are also recognized by these ribosomes. And these upstream open reading frames prevent translation of the uh, downstream open reading frame. So the telencephalon proteins are not made while the neural crest proteins are made and so you go into no crest phase. I, I, How I that works? Just, sorry yeah so i was just wondering because people are now talking about different ribosomal compositions for different translations so i was just wondering from that angle whether you have figured out something out that's sad yeah yeah, yeah. yeah we have we haven't done it so so uh, you know when I, when I have a postdoc in the lab i tell them that whatever they find they can take with them and um achim werner who found this is now having his group in in at the nih and that's a, you know, he, he hopefully will report very soon of how that I, I'm very sure. curious how, the, how this works, but, but that's his discovery. Sure. Thank you. Thank share. you so much. It was brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I'll come to the questions that the audience have uh, raised. And I also see some of our um, attendees raising their hands. So I'll also unmute them as uh, we proceed through this. I'll, Start with Isha's question because that is related to Shankar's first question. So how did you narrow down to zinc and how do we know that other cations will not play a similar role in gluing? Right. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, one of the problems that I'm facing in the lab is we, we often start with screens and the screens bring us into a certain area of biology that we have no idea about what we're doing. And we really don't know what we're doing. And I had no idea about um, metal <laughs> biology <laughs> before this. And, and so we, we had seen when we had narrowed down the, the um, degron where, where we had cysteines, there were three cysteines and there was also a histidine. We thought, well, maybe this is like chelating a zinc atom, but uh, we used a weak chelator and the weak chelator actually didn't do anything. So we had put this aside at that time. But then we solved the structure and in the structure, you actually see the zinc, right? You, you, it's there and you can see it in the, in the, in the spectrum. And, and so we knew there was zinc, zinc there, um, unexpected at the time. Then we used stronger chelators, T-PEN, and then we saw it was essential for binding. Um, now we, we certainly asked the question whether you can use other metal ions as well. Um, the, what I can tell you is that if you add more zinc, so we basically relied on the zinc that was there in our deionized um, water that we use for making buffers, right? But we can add extra zinc. And if we add extra zinc, we make the binding just a bit stable, more stable, we can improve the signal. And that gives you an assay where you can basically throw any other metal in there into the system and see whether it would stabilize this reaction. And it's really only zinc that works. With copper, you see a little bit of an increase, but it's, it's, it's not anywhere close to as zinc. So I wouldn't say that it's the absolute only one, but it's clearly the predominant one that we see. And we did things like 
very directed spectroscopy experiments to really make sure that it's zinc and not other um, iron that we see in this. Okay. Is that okay? Or... I think some data is froze. You can go ahead. Show me now. Uh, so that you are not, can you can you repeat the you know the question or more you are inviting? Uh, no, I, I asked Jotin to go ahead. Okay, okay. We okay. couldn't hear that. Uh, very nice talk, uh, uh, Michelle, sir. Yeah. So my question is uh, from the second part of your talk where you have uh, talked about reductive. Uh, I mean, stress has to be elevated in order to in order for muscle step, uh, muscle cell differentiation. So uh, mm -hmm. what I was uh, Getting a feel like uh, the in during embryo development also there is a metabolic shift from uh, like glycolysis to uh, oxphos. So uh, do you think the same uh, factors which we have found in muscle stem cells uh, are doing this this uh, function in those during developmental stages as well, or those can be different, or is there any <laughs> uh, plan to explore that area? I mean, yeah, and you know, this is this is a fantastic question. So I think where you, you're getting at um, is that uh, when you have a stem cell, uh, a stem cell relies mostly on glycolysis to produce ATP because glycolysis actually doesn't make reactive oxygen species and they are deleterious to maintaining the, the pluripotent state. Yet when you shift to a differentiation state, then you really have to make uh, ATP through the mitochondria, that's when this system really becomes critical. And that's why we see these phenotypes. Um, we see it in, in um, myotubes. They are probably the most acutely changing um, differentiation system in response to metabolic stress. But um, we very much um, think that that is important in other tissues, particularly in the brain, which is often also, of course, a very strong source of ATP uh, use. And where um, people have shown that shifts to oxfos are important for neuronal um, differentiation. And what is really interesting in this respect is that there is a point mutation in femon B in the uh, reductive stress E3 ligase that uh, disrupts neurogenesis, makes it worse, and basically gives you know gives you a, a intellectual disability um, developmental syndrome. Um, and the 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 clever thing about this is that this mutation actually is a, a um, a um, heterozygous mutation. So it's most likely a toxic gain of function. You degrade this protein better. You make, you know, you basically lower the threshold for when you induce the, the reductive stress response. And that, you know, basically interferes with, with neuronal differentiation as well. So, so we think it's more, it's not only in muscle stem cells, it's also neuronal stem cells. Um, when we, when we um, knock out femon B, we see basically a syndromic phenotype uh, that that the whole mouse gets gets much smaller because all of these stem cell differentiations are probably impacted to some extent because under those conditions that the organism cannot make ATP as much as, as as normally so so again this this suggests it's affecting other tissues as well and so we're very much like we're now as next step is going towards um, neuronal differentiation and then the the other next step is going into sort of the lung uh, system. Um, there because reductive, persistent reductive stress causes lung adenocarcinoma. And so we're hoping that by understanding these, these pathways better in the lung, that we might also um, get some ideas about how to treat lung cancer. But very important question. And I think very interesting because it will tell us a lot about how metabolism controls development and how you control metabolism in order to control development. Thank you, sir. Hi. Um, so, um, can you hear me? Because my connection seems to be a little poor you're at fine. the moment. You're, you're, okay. you're fine. You're fine. Okay, great. So, I'll next go to Keith's question. And Keith wants to know, why do you think BTB proteins did not evolve, evolve to make one large protein with tandem domains instead of making separate proteins and then checking if they form homodimers? <laughs> That's a super question. That's a cool question. I love it. Um, yeah, so, so uh, actually they did. There, there is a, a BTB domain where you have two BTB domains in one protein. Um, and, and that thing, of course, cannot use dimerization quality control and becomes resistant to dimerization quality control. That's, 
a, a PTB domain protein that's very important in, in the RAS tumorigenous pathway, which is again, you know, important for lung cancer. So, so we're kind of interested in, that's a very, very good question. Um, at the end of the day, I can't tell you an answer for this. I can only tell you that all of the hypotheses that I had to go in to these, this project were wrong because I thought that, you know, the most clever way to use these BTB domains is uh, that you not only can form a homodimer, but you can actually form heterodimers. And so you get mixed specificity and you get more substrates that you can target, but that doesn't seem to be the case. The heterodimers are really simply inactive and you really have to form a homodimer. Why you want to regulate it, whether it would have been too difficult to get the right orientation so that you have the two substrate binding domains also in the right orientation, I don't know. The dimers themselves are very stable, as I mentioned. Um, so, so there is one example where you have this fusion, um, but, but it's only one example. And we don't know yet why. <laughs> Super question. Now we have a lot of questions around mitochondria. Uh, so people are basically interested in knowing uh, or understanding the fate of defective mitochondrial proteins or defective mitochondria as well. Um, so there are three questions and I'll read to you all of those and uh, we can then uh, summarize. So Puran asks, what is the fate of defective mitochondria? Are these removed by mitophagy? Uh, then, yeah. Do you want to go that? Yeah, yeah. Let, let me start. I'm, I'm, I, my brain is limited. I, yeah, I will yeah, forget yeah. the first. So, so um, this is again a really cool question. So, so basically, what uh, the reductive stress response does is it recognizes a mitochondrium that doesn't produce ATP. So, when it doesn't produce ATP, it doesn't make reactive oxygen species, and the cell runs out of out of reactive oxygen species. What we believe is that if this is a short-term dip, that's when you put in the reductive stress response. But if it would persist for a prolonged amount of time, then you would subject this mitochondrium to, to mitophagy. We don't know where the shift is made, but what is really interesting is that FNP1, again, the key substrate of the reductive stress response um, is binding directly to GABA proteins, which are inducers of autophagy. So, so sort of the working model we have right now is that if you know you the FNP1 comes to mitochondria, it does something, it must inhibit some activity that we don't fully understand. We don't know what the effector is. If you have reductive stress, it's you know degraded basically. But if you have reductive stress for too long and your um, membrane potential probably dips too much, then it's maybe not degraded anymore. And and that leads then to induced induction of mitophagy because this um, gabaret binding protein is on mitochondria. So we're very excited about this because the reductive stress response is a way for us how we can modulate ATP production very precisely. But if that goes awry, then it will be eliminated by mitophagy. And to understand how that switch occurs, that's it's actually one of the new graduate students projects right now in the lab. All right. Uh, the next question is on degradation of mitochondrial proteins. Surabhi wants to know how um, degradation of mitochondrial proteins are regulated. Does it happen inside the mitochondria or through mitochondrial derived compartment? The proteins are pushed out of the mitochondria. Yeah, I think uh, this is a very large field of research. Um, and I think most um, my mitochondrial matrix proteins and probably the inner membrane proteins as well are really turned over by mitochondrial proteases. These are more similar to sort of the protease, uh, the prokaryotic clip B, clip XP kind of proteases, long proteases that, that can chew up proteins in the mitochondrial matrix. The proteins of the mitochondrial outer membrane are uh, eliminated in a process that's very similar to ER associated degradation, where it's ubiquitinated on the surface where P97 VCP extracts the protein from the membrane and hands it over to, to the proteasome. Now, I also think there are proteins that can at least go into the intermembrane space and go back out again in order to be degraded by the, by the proteasome. So there might, must be some exchange between compartments, but how much that is from the matrix, I think that's, that's not known yet. But sort of in, in, in generalizable terms, in the matrix, you have proteases on the surface, you use the ubiquitin pathway. All right. And the next question is, how can we measure the levels of metabolites that are imported and exported from mitochondria? Yeah, we did simple metabolomics and what was the striking? So, so this is basically a mass spec um, approach where you can simply quantitatively measure um, how much of certain metabolites that you can follow is there in your, in your lysate. 
Um, and what was striking for us was that there was only kind of one class of metabolites that accumulated or, or, or was lost when you changed with this. And these were um, the metabolite shuttles. So these are metabolites that can cross the membrane and, and carry something from the cytoplasm into, into mitochondria or where there are transporters basically in the mitochondrial, in the mitochondrial membrane to bring these metabolites into the mitochondria. So it's, it's kind of an indirect analysis where we say that if, if um, FNP1 is, is stabilized, all of these metabolite shuttles basically accumulate in the cytoplasm, which is what we look at. We didn't look at mitochondria themselves, but if we, if we degrade FNP1, they're depleted from theirs because they are now most likely taken up by, by mitochondria. Um, that's, you know, getting very close to the question of what is FNP1 doing? <laughs> you know, what is the reductive stress response actually regulating in order to turn on uh, the, you know, oxidative phosphorylation? And we don't know whether that's direct through, for example, a transport protein or indirect through a protein that modulates um, the membrane potential at the, across the inner mitochondrial membrane, like an uncoupling protein. So that's something that, we, that, that we're looking at right now. Pradeep, I remember you had raised your question, uh, raised your hand. Do you want to ask the question directly? I've unmuted you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can. Yeah. Hi, Professor Michel. This is a nice talk. So my question is regarding this uh, dimerization quality control of the BTB proteins. So in this, like you have shown as the evolutionary conservation of that beta strand, which is being swapped so which is highly variable. But what is the evolutionary conservation of the uh, other beta strand, which is providing the complementary surface for the bindering of the particular beta strand? And do you think that uh, for 200 BTB proteins, will it be difficult to make a complementary surface for all like beta strand to have this? Because it is small beta strand, which is being swept between the two proteins. Yeah, it's it's um, so so so. What these are fantastic questions. Um, the first thing that I can tell you is that th there is at least one or two residues that that accept that beta strand on the on the accepting side, as you as you as you mentioned, that are equally rapidly um, evolving. So so that seems to be complementary complementary really that that it's the sequence and then it's accepting site. Um, the uh, how difficult it is to make the complementary beta strand, I don't know, but what we've done is, let's see whether I get this together. We've, we've made one BTB domain containing protein. And in this BTB domain containing protein, we exchanged basically just the, 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 the molecular barcode. And we then put it into cells and asked what was happening. And we were seeing that indeed, um, there was suddenly um, heterodimerization happening. Um, for this. So, so it was sufficient to put this into the cell and change it, but you didn't um, suddenly heterodimerize with everything in the cell. It was a sort of a, a limited uh, spectrum of BTB domains with, with whom you can um, dimerize. And these typically are the BTB domains that are closer in evolution to, to your cell. So these are the, the, the BTB domains that also have on the, you know, you have a dimerization interface and that dimerization interface um, is also then uh, more similar to each other than if you would have like a completely different BTB domain containing protein. What was interesting was that the same experiments showed us that this now heterodimerizing BTB domain was completely non-functional. It neither bound the substrates of the one nor of the other. So um, basically it's, it's, it's um, you, you know, it, that the barcode is really a very nice way of like distinguishing BTB domains. And it can distinguish BTB domains even between very similar BTB domains that otherwise would have a good chance of, of dimerizing. You will have very distant BTB domains that wouldn't come together at all as well. So, so and for that, you don't need it, basically. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Richard would like to know, how do you use the FBXL17 screen through such a large number of potential dimers to ensure quality control? I don't know whether I, I understand the question. Can you, can you Richard? repeat it maybe? Richard, would you also like to ask the question live? So Richard basically writes here that um, is FB XL17 an essential protein 
how do you perceive FP XL17 screen through such a large number of potential diamonds to ensure quality control? Oh, okay, okay. No, 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 I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah great question. I mean, it's, it's, so, so we can make FPXL17 knockout lines. So, so at least there it's, it's, it's non essential, but these are cell lines. We haven't actually tried to make a knockout mouse and that hasn't been done yet. So I can't tell you whether it's essential for development or not. It seems to be mutated in diseases such as cancer, but I don't, and especially breast cancer, but I don't know whether it's a driver or whether that's a bypassing um, mutation. Um, the, the, question that you're asking really is how can um, a single enzyme sample so many different substrates and then end up on the on the right one and I think you know that's the the core question really of quality control and the interpretation that I have and again this might be completely wrong it's, it's my biased view of the world is that the initial impact is very short-lived that you that you bind and if it's not your substrate you dissociate very very quickly so so I believe FPXL17 can bind PTB domains on a very rapid basis, but if it, it cannot like engage an, an open confirmation, it will dissociate very, very quickly as well. But if it finds a, a, a PTB dimer where you have an open confirmation, then you might um, engage the dissociation step and, and then you're more stably bound and it leads to productive ubiquitillation. And that sort of idea is consistent with um, kinetic work that people have done in the in the ubiquitin field, particularly um, Ray Deshaies has done a lot of work there, who showed that when an E3 ligase binds even its optimal substrate, it's often bound to very short amounts of times, and most of the binding events actually are non-productive. It binds and it dissociates more rapidly than it actually adds the first ubiquitin. But once you, um, for for, you know, the ligases that Ray Deshaies looked at, once the first ubiquitin is on there, then the binding is sort of frozen in place, and you can go. Uh, to a ubiquitin chain. For us, I think it's once the C-terminal helix is in place um, and you you hug the complete domain, then you are like stuck and you will ubiquitilate your protein. But I, I believe initially these will be very transient interactions that, that define this. We'll, we'll, we'll try to go to this question right now with, with single molecule studies. So hopefully that'll tell us something. So the next question we have is from Murtaza Mushtaq. He wants to know, does the binding affinity of amplification operate for all substrate bindings when it comes to E3 ligases like ABC? How does affinity amplification operate here? Uh, what do you mean with affinity amplification? So, says when E3 ligases bind the substrates, there is with time development, more of affinity for the substrate, which is called affinity amplification. Does that, how does that operate? I don't really know. Um, mm -hmm. Murtaza, would you like to ask the question yourself? You see, talking about cooperativity, that you have an initial binding that triggers further tighter interaction, uh, I'm not have sure. I'm also not sure. I, I asked him right away that I do not really understand this question. Anyway, yeah, maybe, if both are. Maybe just more, yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I, I, yes, yes. I, I, I can give it, you know, let me give it a shot with like the cooperativity idea behind this that you engage a single uh, uh, Degron first. I, I call it Degron really as an E3 recognition motif for a substrate, not necessarily something that induces degradation. And, and it is true that, that many substrates have multiple degrons. Now, our reductive stress thingy was really just one degron and it was transferable and that, that's it. But many APC substrates, for example, have a D box and a CAN box um, or a D box, A box, CAN box and or multiple D boxes. The, the most crazy, uh, NRF2 has two uh, sides and they actually bind to two subunits of KEEP1 dimers in order to get um, you know, very high affinity binding. The craziest of all of this was this TCOF1 protein that we discovered for neural crest specification that had 12 <laughs> dagerons and you needed seven of those in order to get mono ubiquitillation and, and neural crest specification in the cell. And we believe simply that that um, delays off rates, basically reduces off rates, delays um, you know, dissociation of the substrate, gives the E3 ligase enough time to transfer ubiquitin onto, onto the substrate by, by basically holding on if one you know, the Degron dissociates, the another one will still keep it in place kind of under these conditions. Um, what that is important is sometimes that's, that's more important than in other times. I think, um, you know, 
for the reductive stress response. You probably want to be so sensitive that you don't want to have something like this. You want to be really in the very dynamic range. Whereas for, for something like, like the ribosome specification pathway, you really want to make sure that you get that ubiquitin in the right place. And so that's where you might need, need that. But, but there is, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely true that there are a lot of substrates that have more than one decron and they might go through a process like this where it's um, sort of cooperative binding and, and, and you know, then much more stable binding. But there are a few principles I think that have been worked out there. Zeba, would you like to go next? Yes, uh, hi, Professor Ape. Um, Very nice talk. So uh, actually I actually have two questions. The first question is like uh, RBX1, as we know, also binds with zinc for its proper conformation. So if we deplete zinc in the system, so which will go off first, SNP1 or RBX1? Uh, like yeah, for the assembly super, to work. That, that, that's a super question, Siba. And, and that's of course um, one that we that we addressed very, very early on. So, so as, just to, to explain it, the catalytic subunit of these uh, Colin ring ligases has a zinc finger, a ring finger, which is basically a zinc binding element as well. And so when we treat cells with T-pen, for example, we could, of course, reduce, uh, get the zinc out of the complex between femon B and FNP1, or we could get it out of RBX1. And the latter one would be very boring because it would simply be um, inactivating the E3 ligase. So in order to control against this, um, we developed a second um, a uh, Cullen ring ligase based reporter system. This is one that is dependent upon thalidomide, the image that uses the same RBX1 subunit, which depends on zinc. And so we can monitor in parallel the FNP1 degradation and the image dependent degradation. And we found that, you know, under the conditions that we use, the FNP1 was completely stabilized, but the, the, the image based degradation was not affected at all. So we know that under our conditions, that the zinc bound by the ring finger is so stably bound that you cannot extract it. And that's what I've been told is, is, is the expected stability of this complex. Whereas the interface zinc that we see for substrate recognition is less stably bound and that actually allows you to extract it and, and, and interfere with it. So we controlled for this. It's a very important question. And, and, and we yeah. did that experiment. Yeah, thank you so much. The uh, second query is like, how do you identify which culling based CRL goes with which F box protein? Like, if you identified any new F box, in this case, M1B or K1, so how do you identify that which uh, culling, culling 2 or culling 3? So, do you always isolate the complex and solve the structure or which other approach you identify? So, so I'm not 100 percent sure whether I, I understood your question, but but what we did um, basically for um, the muscle screen, for example, was that our first screen that we did, so I didn't show you the first screen. The first screen that we did was um, with a Cullen scaffold. So we used all, there are seven Cullens in, in human in, in, yeah. or in mouse cells, and we depleted those and we saw particular strong effects actually of Cullen 2 and Cullen 3 um, depletion on myogenesis. We then made cell lines where we expressed flag tag, Cullen 2 or, or Cullen 3, IPed and mass spec what we got out of there. So we had a list of the um, adapters in those, in those cell types. Um, and you know we then use a, a bioinformatic approach for Cullen 2. We look for the VHL box for Cullen 3. We look for the B2B domain. And these are the direct ones. Then based on those, we made a custom-based sRNA library. And that was the screen that I showed you where we yeah. found keep one in, in, this, in this screen. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the answer. The next question is probably a quick one. Um, so Pinaki wants to know, uh, are prions also degraded using ubiquitination? What, what, what is the question? Are I, I, prions also degraded? Prions, prions. Yeah. You know, I, I think so. Uh, it's to some point clearly, but but um, the the key question and that's a question that and you know I didn't talk about today, but we are extremely interested in the lab is when you have protein aggregation, at some point you will be resistant to proteasomal degradation because the proteasome, you know, especially if you have these cross beta um, aggregates, the proteasome cannot take this apart. And um, so for, we are very interested in understanding when this transition from a proteasome sensitive to a proteasome resistant state actually occurs. If you have a mature prion, it will not be degraded by, by the proteasome, but it could still be turned over at least in part by autophagy, which, which is also a ubiquitin independent pathway. Uh, 
So I think if you can harness the ubiquitin system for those proteins, it might be beneficial, it might be very much beneficial. So um, Shiva also has a more general question. Uh, he wants to know, during differentiation, do you think degradation of precursor cell proteins and production of daughter cell proteins are coupled? Um, that I don't know. I, 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 sim I simply cannot tell you any informed thing about it. Um, we, know, we, we do know that, that stress E3 ligases are very important for, for maintaining pluripotency. And, and, but, but we, I think we got that towards sort of transcriptional regulation that probably is not really looking at the overall composition. There are certainly, you know, asy you know um, asymmetric events in, in cell division that occur during development. And you have, for example, centrosomes being uh, asymmetrically inherited and, and, and so forth. Whether degradation there is any in any way dependent on the history, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Because, you know, you have to, the older a protein gets, the more likely it is to experience structural damage that it can be taken out by, by the ubiquitin proteasome system. But on the flip side, when you make new proteins, a lot of the newly made proteins are very sensitive for ubiquitilation and degradation when they come off the ribosome. So it is sort of uh, difficult, I think, to generalize that question. All right, so we have Shudipto and Shankar both raising their hands. So we'll go to Shudipto first and then Shankar and with that we'll end our session today. Shudipto? Yeah, I, it's amazing to listen to you, Professor Jeff. So uh, I have a question, uh, like what I understood from your uh, this amazing story on reductive stress. So it's basically uh, like the uh, lack of reducing agent in the cell, which is sensed by the, those uh, sensors. So do you think there is a like modulation of the sensing, like incre increasing concentration of, uh, like reducing, uh, introducing concentration of oxygen to reducing condition? Is there any kind of modulation which is sensed or is it like kind of one zero? Yeah, that, that's a super question, Sudipa. It's, it's a, a, a fantastic question, a biologically extremely important question. And my, my, my guess is, that yes, it is going to be modulated. You have to modulate it because you have, uh, as I mentioned before, these um, developmental transitions where the importance of oxidative phosphorylation changes. And of course, if you rely oxidative phosphorylation, you need the reductive stress response. When you don't need oxidative phosphorylation, you, it doesn't matter all that much and you don't need that anyway. So different levels of reactive oxygen species, I think have to trigger that stress response differently in different cell types. And in order to do this, I think you need, as you call them, modulators. And so we think you could get these modulators in terms of small molecule metabolites that change the affinity of the E3 ligase to, to the substrate, or in terms of um, proteins that might inhibit, for example, FNP1 um, recognition by the E3 ligase. Um, and you know, my bet right now is that um, it's both <laughs> to some extent. Uh, but, but that requires a little bit more work on our side. Uh, what, what, what makes me very confident that there are these inhibitors is, as I mentioned before, there, there are these point mutations in FEM1B that activate the E3 ligase and that activation is deleterious for development. So that means you really have to keep it in, 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 in shape. You, 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 you cannot hyperactivate it. And that to me means there must be inhibitors of this, this enzyme. Thank you. And did you check in other uh, like organelles which have their own types of like uh, like their own way of regulating oxidation oxidative condition of the condition like inside the ER or some other uh, compartments? Um, so inside the ER we we're not looking because the ubiquitin system is cytoplasmic, so you have to get out of the ER, and so the the um, discrimination there would be done by by other enzymes. We haven't looked at that simply. But what I'm very interested in, we haven't actually started working on this, but I'm extremely interested in this is uh, the peroxisome, which is also a source of, of oxidation and reactive oxygen species. And there is a very important E3 ligase, PEX10 in um, peroxisomes. And mutations of that enzyme causes a, a neurodevelopmental disease. So, so um, that tells me that there might be something around there as well that, that we should look at. We haven't started with this, but, but um, uh, we very much uh, want to look at that. I have to say though, that 
you know, the reductive stress response is one way of how um, you can sense mitochondria. Mitochondria are so complex that I will believe there are many more stress pathways that impinge just on mitochondria. And since we seem to have like a very sensitive screening system right now that re really nicely reports on mitochondria, I guess we we're first um, really trying to get everything out of that screening system to understand how, how mitochondria operate. But, but it's a very, very, very good question. Um, looking at other organelles in the cell, super exciting, super interesting. Uh, another question that I would be very, very excited if, if I would have endless funding and endless space, <laughs> um, I would look also to reactive nitrogen species um, because you have the same problem. They're clearly important in signaling, but if you have too many of them, it, it would be bad for the cell as well. So, so there must be a, a stress pathway there as well, which you know we haven't started even thinking about that yet. But, but yeah, these are very important questions. Thank you. Shankar? I lowered my hand, so I'm fine with that. Okay, all right. <laughs> so with that, we'll call the session a close today. And we all thank you very much, Professor Rafi. The session was super exciting. The experiments were beautiful and the story is amazing. And I think the discussion already shows how excited people are with the kinds of questions that come up from this field. And, and it has always been a very fundamental field. So no doubts on that. So thank you very much. And uh, we really hope to see you someday in person when the world is in a better shape and times. Thank you so much for joining. And thank, thank you, you, Shankar, for joining us too. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Well, well, say thank hi. you for having me. Yeah, say hi to John on our behalf. Yeah. yeah. I, I will tell him. I will say hi to John. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And maybe you can alert him that we may invite him for one of our next talks.